These results would seem to indicate that the superconducting transition might involve more than a change from finite to infinite conductivity. The external magnetic field influences the temperature at which this transition occurs. Therefore, it seems natural to ask whether the magnetic properties of the material don't also undergo a change. As a matter of fact, the laws of electricity and magnetism have something to say about magnetic fields in materials with infinite conductivity. Let me explain it the following way. As we have seen before on our voltmeters, there can be no potential difference between two points in a material with infinite conductivity, even if a current is flowing through it. So the potential has the same value at all points. This means that the electric field intensity is zero. It also means that no electromotive forces whatever can exist in the material. In particular, consider the induced electromotive force which would exist around circuits whenever the magnetic flux is changing with the time, as we know from Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. But in our material, no such EMF may exist. Therefore, the magnetic flux cannot change with time in the material. To put it succinctly, the magnetic flux density cannot change with time in a material of infinite conductivity. Any magnetic flux which resides in it while it has infinite conductivity is frozen to it as long as it has infinite conductivity. We now wish to find out by experiment what actually does happen to magnetic flux during the transition from the normal to the superconducting state. For this purpose, we'll put a tin cylinder into the liquid helium with its axis at right angles to the field of the electromagnet. In its median plane, we position an array of many small compass needles. As you can see, the needles are free to turn and tend to align themselves parallel to the magnetic flux they see. Our device is in the doer. The tin sample is normal and the flux density is 80 Gauss. The needles are oriented parallel to the magnetic field. This indicates that the magnet's flux is essentially unaffected by the presence of the cylinder and permeates across it unaltered in density. As a matter of fact, the permeability of the superconducting materials in their normal states differs very little from unity. The failure of some needles to point horizontally is not due to the magnetic properties of the cylinder, but to their own small magnetic fluxes and mutual interactions. Our next step is to cool the tin cylinder into the superconducting state while holding the magnetic field constant. It so happens that this transition takes a considerable length of time with the experimental setup we have here. For our large cylinder in a field of 80 Gauss, a good deal of heat must be carried off before the transition is complete. Now, we do this by pumping off helium vapor, and the heat of vaporization of helium is quite small. In fact, the transition proceeds so slowly that we are showing it to you at six times normal speed. Notice that the compass needles are turning. The directions they are taking on show that the magnetic flux is coming out of the cylinder. We are witnessing here an effect of fundamental importance in superconductivity. Magnetic flux is ejected during the transition to the superconducting state. It's called the Meissner effect and occurs in all superconductors. There is one special group of superconductors which under ideal conditions eject all the flux during this transition. Tin and most of the other metallic elements exhibiting superconductivity belong to this group. They are called type 1 superconductors. The effect is then called the complete Meissner effect. It should be emphasized that this demonstration does not in itself prove that the magnetic flux is completely excluded from the cylinder. It could be partially excluded and show roughly the same exterior flux configuration. In tin, 
and in all other type 1 superconductors, the flux density B is identically zero under ideal conditions. This could not be predicted from the knowledge that the material has infinite conductivity, or that, to say it another way, the electric field is zero in the material. As we saw earlier, the fact that E vanishes requires only that B may not change with the time. So we must consider the Meissner effect as a separate and independent phenomenon of superconductivity, consistent with, but not a consequence of, infinite conductivity. In our next experiment, we want to demonstrate that the Meissner effect in tin is complete. We've wound some insulated copper wire into a coil of several hundred turns directly on a piece of tin. The coil senses changes of magnetic flux in the cylinder. The terminal leads will come out of the door through this tube. The cylinder is placed in the door with its axis parallel to the field of the electromagnet. By Faraday's law of induction, any time rate of change of magnetic flux through this coil induces an electromotive force. The rate of change of flux multiplied by the number n of coil turns is numerically equal to the EMF induced in the coil. Therefore, the time integral of this voltage is a measure of the change of flux during a given time interval. In our experiment, this voltage integral, or voltage impulse, will be about four-tenths of a millivolt second. To record the time integral of the induced voltage, we use this instrument. It is a digital integrating voltmeter of very high voltage sensitivity. The time integral of input voltage will appear on the dial in millivolt seconds with a decimal point here. The cylinder and coil are in liquid helium above the transition temperature for tin. Our plan is first to turn on the magnetic field while the tin cylinder is in the normal state and to record the voltage impulse. Then, while keeping the field constant, we cool the cylinder through the superconducting transition and again measure the voltage impulse. We are slowly turning on the magnetic field up to a flux density of 40 Gauss. The dial records corresponding voltage impulse, which is the measure of the admitted flux. Its final value is plus 0.401 millivolt second. We record this value and set the meter dial back to zero. Now we begin pumping on the liquid helium, as you can see by the increased rate of boiling. This cools the thin cylinder. During all this time, the current in the coils of the electromagnet is being held constant. A negative voltage impulse is piling up, indicating the onset of the superconducting transition. <laughs>